I get to introduce my son. Um, Davey's actually been to a few SIR meetings as Roger and I were saying, well, we didn't, he didn't recognize him. Well, he was much younger then, but we <laughs> remained the same. Um, so, uh, actually I recruited him uh, to join SIR. I gave him to a, a membership for Christmas last year. And what better way to do it is get him to be a pre presenter. So he's kind of like a backup guy. Nobody else had him fill it in. So Davey's originally, and his, uh, his title is David Stroll, but we, his hockey name is Davey. Uh, so uh, so we'll call, I call him Davey. And I guess his other name is Dave. So uh, <laughs> teachers call him Dave. The originally from, from, uh, uh, from Houghton, Graduated in engineering uh, from Michigan Tech. He did graduate work at Virginia Tech. And now works for the small consulting firm in the Detroit area. Uh, played youth and high school hockey uh, and senior hockey. Played for the uh, uh, Portage Lake Pioneers uh, one winter. And has been an equipment manager for the U.S. sled hockey team. So it kind of ties together with some of the stuff Fred was talking about. Um, he did try sled hockey. Uh, just, but he's not, he didn't have the right qualifications to be a member of the team. So this afternoon he's going to talk uh, a little bit. I, I'm on here because I recruited him, but I dug out a few slides on hockey hit, uh, helmets, uh, the history. And he's ready to talk about some of the work that's been done at Virginia Tech on hockey helmets. So here you are. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. So the, as a man I said, I've been a couple of sermons. It's always nice to. Uh, be with a group of people that are so passionate about what they like to do. Um, so I'm here today, I got recruited to talk about some of the work I have done um, in grad school. Uh, it's involving uh, helmet testing, specifically my background was in youth football, but while, while I was there, there's lots of hockey helmet testing going on, and I'm familiar with it. Um, so we'll get started. Oh, my dad. And uh, found this photo, um, I believe it's one of the earlier photographs of a player actually uh, wearing a helmet. Um, it's the 1914-1915 Portland Rosebuds, and the player in the helmet um, is Ernie Moose Johnson. Um, and then my dad threw this photo out there, and actually uh, Eric Zweig found a uh, newspaper article documenting um, this wearing of the helmet, he didn't wear it for very long. He was wearing it um, because he had previously fractured his jaw. And it's kind of interesting, this article, you also see down there, there's an employer who broke his nose, but he, he'll be ready to go against Cyclone Taylor in the upcoming game. So that was kind of, as players only wore helmets as needed after injuries, um, the first player to actually consistently wear a helmet was uh, <coughs> Boston's Bruins defenseman George Owen um, during the 28-29 season. He had uh, played football actually at Harvard, so he took his football helmet from Harvard and modified it and wore it while he was playing for the Bruins. Um, so in this photo you'll see Eddie Shore um, as well as George Owen and Art Ross, which kind of brings me to my next story here. Um, with Ace Bailey and Eddie Shore. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Ace Bailey, Eddie Shore incident. Um, in a game in 1933, Eddie Shore hit Ace Bailey. Ace Bailey's head hit the ice. Um, Ace Bailey nearly died actually from the injuries he sustained. Uh, never played again. But after this incident, there was a push. Um, league-wide to mandate helmets. Multiple teams um, adopted this Art Ross design helmet. Most of them, the experiment was very, very short-lived. Players didn't like the helmets at all. However, Eddie Shore was one player to adopt the helmet and actually wore it for the rest of his career. So there's many reasons why the players didn't like the helmets. One, they were too hot, too uncomfortable, it gave them headaches. No one will recognize me. How will I become popular? How will I make my money? Um, I'm chicken. Nobody's going to respect me. Um, but there were some positives. Some players adopted them to cover bald spots. <laughs> more, more for that reason. Um, 
so in my ads research, also he came across uh, Charlie Burns, who actually grew up here in Detroit, Michigan, um, moved to Toronto, um, and he was well known for sporting this thick leather helmet. Um, he actually fractured his skull as a youth, so he, he continued to wear the helmet throughout his career. So moving forward into the 1950s and the 1960s, um, the NCAA adopted and mandated the use of helmets for all their players. So <coughs> there is Tony Esposito, and uh, Sweden had their classic helmets um, that they wore were starting to come into North America and be utilized frequently. Also in the 1960s, we see rules mandating uh, youth players throughout the U.S. and Canada to wear helmets. You'll see Wayne Gretzky there as a youth and then with the Sioux Greyhounds. Um, interesting helmet here um, on your right is the Patterson helmet and it was designed by uh, General Electric in the 1970s. Um, and it just kind of shows how uh, technology was starting to play a role. They were using more sophisticated materials, more sophisticated designs to help protect these players. And actually, G, um, a kind of initiative they had, they were trying to um, make this helmet pretty much available at cost for anybody who, who wanted it. So this was a quote I came across from uh, Theodore Roosevelt. <coughs> it was in uh, respect to football, American football, but I believe it kind of applies to hockey. He said, I believe in rough games and in rough manly sports. I do not feel any particular sympathy for the person who gets battered about a good deal, so long as it's not fatal. Um, <laughs> kind of an old school approach to it, but um, he was instrumental in building the NCAA and getting player safety rules passed there. Um, so this kind of goes forward into the death of Bill Masterson in uh, 1968. Um, Bill had played college hockey at the University of Minnesota, um, and in his rookie season, he uh, got hit and lost consciousness and never woke up. So after the first and only death uh, in, by a, of an NHL player, there was push uh, to begin to mandate helmets and head protection in the NHL. So that rule was finally passed in 1979, in which uh, all players coming into the league um, were required to wear helmets. Um, players who had been in the league were able to be grandfathered in, and it was their decision whether or not they wanted to wear the helmet or not. Um, I'm sure you guys recognize the guy on your right, um, Craig McTavish. He was the last player to not wear a helmet, and his last season was with the Blues in 1996-1997. Uh, oh, yeah, right. So now to get more into my engineering background, um, this is the testing we conducted at Virginia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the idea behind a helmet, especially in hockey, there are so many impact scenarios you have to account for. You have pucks flying at very fast velocities, you have sticks, you have ice, you have bodies, you have boards. So these helmets have to be able to withstand a wide variety of impacts. Um, specifically, uh, from an engineering standpoint, the hard outer shell has to, it acts to disperse the force over a wider range so it's not a focal, focal impact. Secondly, you want to decelerate the head to reduce the force the person experiences, and that is kind of um, what the interior padding acts to do. So currently, um, helmets to be used by hockey players, they have to go through the, these certification processes. Um, specifically, um, this came up a little blurry, but you see the CSA sticker, you see the HEC who uses the ASTM standard, and the CE right here, that's the European standard. And each of these um, organizations have their own specific test criteria that helmets have to meet before they're able to be sold and used 
Um, interestingly enough, uh, helmets only have a lifespan of about six and a half years. Um, all these organizations, uh, specifically HEC, recommend replacing your helmet after that six and a half years just because of the deterioration of the uh, interior and exterior components of the helmet. <coughs> So the one thing these standards all have in common are their pass-fail standards. Um, I would have pulled all the standards for you, but they have that nice uh, paywall where they want $50, $85 just to look at them. So, uh, but typically they are uh, drop tests from a certain height, and if they uh, meet this certain <coughs> criteria, they're good to go. We don't know whether they met it by the thinnest of margin, or they met it, they exceeded it with flying colors. Secondly, uh, most of these standards are intended to reduce the incidence of catastrophic head injury. So we have significant brain injury and skull fracture. Uh, they're moving towards uh, including some tests to account for concussions and more mild forms of brain injury. But as, of, as they currently stand, to my knowledge, it's, it's a pretty uh, um, easy threshold to me. So now I get into my background. Um, I went to grad school <coughs> at Virginia Tech and they were doing all sorts of helmet testing. Um, my mentor is there had been doing uh, head injury research um, and specifically for the auto industry um, and they were looking for good head impact data so what better head impact database than you get a bunch of young kids running into each other because they want to um, so we get good injury tolerance numbers as for concussion and non-concussion um, impacts so he was working instrument in these players, and the equipment manager, oh, you're an expert in head injuries, what helmet should I buy? Well, he didn't really know. They all meet these, similar to hockey helmets, they all meet these certain standards. Um, so he started brainstorming a little bit, and he's like, what if we had a rating system similar to automobiles, whereas these cars, they go through um, their safety standards, they have pass-fail criteria, and then on top of that, they also have these tests they go through, so consumers can be knowledgeable, oh, I know my car is a five-star safety rated car or a four-star safety rated car. Well, it's actually my car, so you can go and <laughs> find out how well your, your car did. Um, so what came from that is they came up with a test, uh, set of test criteria um, accompanied with all their on-field collected data to eventually make a uh, helmet rating system. So this came out uh, around 2011, 2012, um, and it's been around ever since, constantly updated. At a, around 2015 or so, they updated it to include hockey helmets. <coughs> so this is the current test setup for the hockey helmets. We have our test head form mounted to a biofidelic neck, um, and we have a pendulum system. So if the pendulum acts it's nice and consistent, you get a consistent impact, just because it's all you're testing is gravity. And this head form is mounted on the slide table, and the slide table is meant to um, imitate the torso and the torso mass. So you get an idea of what kind of velocity impacts we can attain with this system. Um, so this is a slow motion test with actually a football helmet, and I, I believe this was the top, top um, impact velocity we, we can get, we test. So these are the type of impacts players will see maybe once or twice in a season, but the helmet is meant to um, reduce the acceleration that the player would experience. So to incorporate this star rating, there's multiple things. And to not complicate things too much, I'll just 
won't break down that. <laughs> I'll break down this question a little more simply. That makes sense. But uh, basically, they test the helmet at a variety of locations and a variety of energy levels. So it accounts for the lowest of impacts the players will experience, as well as the worst impacts the players will experience throughout the season. And then, so we take each of those impacts and their um, metrics, which we are able to measure with uh, instrumentation within that dummy, and we say, well, how many times a season does a typical player see that type of impact? So there's actually data that has been taken at the University of Wisconsin for their men's and women's uh, hockey team, as well as some youth teams, um, some bantam age players, where they have um, the types of impacts play hockey players will see, the uh, magnitude of those impacts, where on the head they're receiving those impacts, as well as the number of impacts per playing session. So we're able to quantify that, and then using our test data, we say, okay, so how risky of an impact is that? Um, measuring the linear acceleration and the rotational acceleration of the head, and correlating that to the risk of concussion. So all that goes together, and you get your star rating, and the helmets are ranked accordingly. So once they developed the mythology, they, they went through and tested all the helmets available on the market at the time. And surprisingly, there wasn't a relationship between the price of the helmet and how safe the helmet was. So today, as I said, they're continually updating it. This is the top rated helmet at the moment, the CCM. FL 500, and you can see just the amount of padding compared to some of the older helmets, and it's, it's a little safer. Personally, I bought this Bauer React 75, just it's a little less thick, so I, I like that one. But uh, so now at Virginia Tech, they've done football helmets. Um, I did a lot of work with the youth football helmets. Um, they've got in soccer headgear. Um, they just released the bicycle helmet ratings um, to do bicycles and they're working towards some other sports as well. So that pretty well wraps it up. Um, I'd be happy to take any uh, questions or comments. It, do the helmet manufacturers automatically just send you the stuff or do you have to bug they, them? We, we buy them or they would buy them just how any consumer would buy them. So um, just go on the market, pay whatever the consumer pays buy them, get whatever the consumer gets, test them. Yeah, the big complaint about hockey helmets <coughs> is part of what you already acknowledged uh, that players had. Well, people are not going to recognize me. And in the old days, we used to have the glory of seeing what the whole player looked like. So my question is, why can't the helmet tops be clear? So you could actually see their <laughs> see their ball spots. Well, I mean, you get into the paddings, so it's hard to make that clear too. Well, of course, <laughs> but for the rest of it, yeah, yeah, like the outer surface. Yeah, well, I think they've kind of moved beyond that attitude. <laughs> 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 they have social media. Now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the cameras are better too. So. David, there's an expiry date on the helmet. I think yep. it's seven years. Yep. So after that, you're not insured or can, can't sue? I'm not sure what the policy as far as the helmet manufacturers go. I think it's seven years. You have to get a new helmet yep. theoretically for every seven years. Yep. People don't know that. Yep. I thought it was five. Well, whatever it is, it's around. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think Heck, heck says six and a half. But, yeah, but it, it, there should be a warning. Same as bad seats. <laughs> yeah, then, I th typically on that sticker, they have the date when you know, it is. So I have a technical engineering question for okay. you, if you can say. Yeah. Um, have you looked at the newtons of force being applied to the helmet and what the reduction of the newtons of force are? And are, is that part of the, uh, I couldn't tell if that was actually part of the equation? Yeah, yeah. So um, we don't actually look at the application to the helmet. We look at the response of the head. 
So there's actually, uh, it's basically an instrumentation block, that, um, three linear accelerometers, as well as an angular rate sensor. Um, and so we measure the kinematics of the head rather than the actual application of the force because we want to relate it to the injury. And that injury has been documented to be related to those metrics. So in the back. I have a non-technical question. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, let's say if, if a player has some concussion with the helmet he's wearing right at that point, is it smart that the next time he goes back on ice he has a new helmet? Um, it depends, I guess. If there's any damage to the helmet, yes, for sure. Um, but otherwise, it's just the helmet, the hockey helmet specifically meant to withstand a number of impacts. And in testing them, you see they're pretty consistent. So um, if he wants to upgrade his helmet, that's great. But um, they're pretty consistent in um, mitigating impacts. So they don't degrade or anything. Not not over the number of hits, no. You mentioned some sports where you're you're working working towards having helmets too. Can you can you name some sports that currently don't see helmets and that where they're coming? Um, well, soccer is one in general. Um, specifically, they don't, they're not necessarily going towards a helmet as in hockey. They have <coughs> headbands. Um, where a lot of their injuries come from players going up for headers. So they're starting to move towards um, protective head, head, head gear. In that sense, um, a lot of youth leagues will mandate it. Um, <coughs> curling is uh, yeah. curling. Curling, curling curling experiment, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. For, for somebody. Figure skating. Flips. Still a certain level. Yep, exactly. Figure skating. I've seen women's lacrosse is starting <coughs> to think about it. Um, rugby. I have another quick quick question. Uh, you mentioned North Georgia League being the first one to wear a uh, helmet currently. Did you did you find act definite proof that he was that he did wear a helmet while he was wearing or playing the NHL? Because I I've looked for that. I'll defer it. I've looked for that and I haven't found it. I guess I thought every place you look, they always say he's the first, but I haven't yeah, seen it any further. There's no. That's no why I, I raised the question uh, with with uh, last polls. I discovered this photo and more raised the question, is he, is Moose Johnson the first? And, uh, and uh, Eric was so kind, he found the article and backed that up. The one interesting one uh, that, uh, that they, they did show was that, that Rosebud's picture in the bullet that appeared first as Flip. And JP, he said, uh, oh no, it's, it's backwards. Right. Was, uh, JP was somebody uh, somebody who knows JP. So Dave had shown the correct orientation of the picture. And somebody zoomed right in and found the P's backwards on it. But every website you see without a picture is is in flip. So interesting. Question yeah. What is the financial motivation or the return on investment for Virginia Tech in doing this extensive research? Uh, zero. Uh, so they do it. The only thing they do is get research grants, um, continuing with the head injury research. But financially, it's independent. And what would be the nature of the uh, source of grants? Uh, there's some from the NCAA, uh, the Department of Defense, um, the NIH, the National Institute of Health. You're not allowed to can you hold the screen or a, a case on the helmet? Does that degrade the integrity of the helmet? Um, there has been some preliminary testing done. Um, so if you notice in the pictures I show, we don't actually test the facial area, but the initial testing sh showed that it, it does influence it somewhat. That it does influence it. Yeah. Is there any? Uh projection for testing to uh, do uh, like the upper helmet protection plus a uh, lower jaw protection? So currently uh, like those tests or those uh, certification agencies they also have um, tests in place to test face shields and as well as goalie masks but as far as Virginia Tech goes there's no initial plans to do that. 
So I'm looking at the website. It doesn't indicate when the tests were done. Right. So uh, is that a continuous? Yeah, continuous. So as new helmets so, come out, you test them? Yeah, exactly. So that the top CCM that just came out last year, I think. Okay. So it's, it's a rolling, rolling test series. Dave, do you want to comment? The uh, first two, first year or so they did the test, there was almost no such thing as a one-star helmet. There's a lot of zero star helmets in here. Oh yes, there are a lot of zero star helmets, even today. Yeah. In your slide there, they showed the different helmets. I noticed in the lower right hand corner in each one, there was a number. <clears throat> the score. Yep, so that's, okay. that's, that, that's that star score. And then, so we take that star score, and then you basically, um, Break them up. So say your star okay. score was between one and three. That's a one star <coughs> helmet. Or if it's between, looks like one and yeah, one and one and three is five star. Mm -hmm. Between three and five is four star. So on. Okay. Oh. All right. That's uh, uh, the yeah. answer. Can anything on the, the old Stan Makita helmets. <laughs> I don't think those test well. <laughs> they don't do q yeah. okay. Is that what you have? <laughs> Believe it or not, I have one guy who skates them. <laughs> Red Wings here in that. Because, uh, because of the lawsuits occurring with the NHL, has the uh, check or anybody else in the business been called on? So, so we support the testing? That's a, that's a good question. So, um, actually, in my time I was there, they did get a uh, subpoena for their test data. So, they, and they, they've been a, uh, also instrumental in some of the development of the, all these organizations are looking to update some of their uh, test standards. You mentioned that based on price point, there's, there's no correlation between star and price point on, on different brands. But, but what about within the brand, if you were going CCM helmets, is there a significant difference between yeah, right. the top of the line five star and and the lower price there, point? Of the <coughs> there may be now, but um, when they initially tested them, I don't think there was. So there's, there's no value to buying the most Not expensive necessarily. helmet. Uh, there might unless be, you want to look more stylish. Yeah, now now that these have been on for a while, and, uh, consumers are becoming a little more knowledgeable. There, there probably is, but how many how many helmets are in the database? Ooh, it's 30 or something. It's a lot, yeah, it's 30 something. Do you try helmets when you adjust the size? I mean, do you only have one test head in there? Yep, one test foot. So you don't know if it, you put a bigger or a smaller head in if it would change the rating? Uh, so you, we would buy the helmets to fit that specific right. head form, so. But again, some of them, when you pull it out, I would think they become a little weaker. Right, right, so it, it's, it's, I mean, you're limited in your resources, sure. but you, you test for one specific criteria and you're, you're testing a comparison. So right. you're testing all these helmets under the same conditions. Okay. I know that you want to see that equation again, you to write it down and check out. <laughs> and it's been a while since you've seen an equation with that many variables in it at a certain presentation. So, so thank you very much, Dave. Really nice job. Thank you.